Hi, and welcome to the Club Lucha podcast. I am your host, Foos, or the person who runs Club Lucha on TikTok. If you're coming from TikTok, welcome in. Thank you so much for your support. And I'm happy to see you here over on the podcast. This is our very first episode of the Club Lucha podcast. So we're going to get right into it. Um, but before we begin, I do want to briefly talk about the podcast, what it's about, and what will come for the Club Lucha podcast in the future. This is a podcast that is born from a very deep interest in Lucha Libre. Um, I am not, and I want to say this straight up from the very beginning so no one claims otherwise, I do not consider myself an expert on Lucha Libre. I do not consider myself uh, the end-all be-all of knowledge of Lucha Libre. That's not me. I don't know everything, and I'm just going to straight up tell you right now. I'm very interested in Lucha Libre. I like uh, watching Lucha Libre. I watch old CML cards, old AAA cards almost every night, and I try and learn as much about Lucha Libre as I possibly can, but I am not an expert. I just have a really deep interest in it, and I really like watching it. So just letting that uh, be known from the very beginning. Um, Lucha Libre, to me, uh, the first time I ever watched it, the first time I ever came across, I was a kid um, growing up in a Mexican household, so, you know, uh, one of the channels that was on a lot, Univision, Telemundo, and we didn't get Galavision, but you could kind of watch it. It was a little busted, but I remember Triple A would come on Galavision, and this was the era of, um, I, I remember seeing a lot, Cibernético, El Mesías, uh, La Legión Extranjera, The Hell Brothers, Charlie, Manson, and Chessman, uh, La Parca was there. Um, it was a good era, and I really liked watching it, and it was really interesting to me because at the same time, I was watching WWE, I was watching SmackDown, um, I didn't have cable, so I couldn't get Raw, but I remember SmackDown came on uh, UPN, and then that transitioned over to the CW, so I was watching SmackDown, and then this new Lucha Libre, this new type of wrestling in Spanish came on one day when I was flipping through the channels, and I saw it on Galavision, and I would watch it on Saturdays on there, and I was just hooked um, I didn't keep up with it for a while. It's been kind of like an in and out interest thing, but I have always enjoyed uh, when I was watching it. Um, Consejo Mundial de Lucha Libre, CMLL, the other big company, I did not get an early exposure to that like I got an early exposure to AAA. However, I will say that now I am a bigger fan of El Consejo than I am of AAA. I have gone to um, Arena Mexico, I went to Mexico City. I watched a Friday show, which their Friday shows are, I personally think, their best shows, more of like their, their big shows, their main event shows weekly. Um, they run shows a lot of the days of the week, but their Friday shows are where it's at. And if you ever get the chance, I would highly recommend go down to Mexico City, pay, you know, the $30 that it costs to, and this, this is, the $30 gets you almost in the very front row, in the very front section. So you're paying $30 for being right up next to the ring. Um, you can pay less and be further back, but that's what I paid. I was right up on the ring, and it was one of the best experiences, one of the best wrestling experiences that I've ever had. So I highly recommend, if you ever get the chance, take a trip down to Mexico City, go watch some CMLL, and enjoy yourself. It's a really, really good experience. I bought some masks. Um, I ate some maruchan in the in the uh, Arena Mexico because that's one of the concessions they sell. At a co uh, ice cold beer, it was it was great, you know. Go down and do that. Anyway, um, like I said, I am not an expert, but I just really, really love Lucha Libre. I love the history of Lucha Libre. I love learning about the past of Lucha Libre. I like watching the guys now in their prime. I like watching guys who I think in the future will be the future of Lucha Libre. So that is the Club Lucha Podcast. I have three segments planned for this podcast today. On our first segment, we have a quick roundup of all the happenings in Lucha Libre and pro wrestling as a whole. Our second segment will go into kind of like an extended version of the Lucha History videos that I do over on TikTok. We're going to add a little bit more context, a little bit more information to that. And today we're going to be talking about Juventud Guerrera. Um, and then our last segment uh, for today uh, is going to be a Lucha movie spotlight, which is going to be kind of like uh, watching classic Lucha Libre movies, discussing them, talking about them, um, giving them a little bit of review, and um, just overall enjoying them. In future episodes, we will have guests. This very first episode, I have no guests. I wanted to see how this would play out, format our first show, and really see... Um, 
you know, how people reacted to this. And this is something that I'm going to keep doing regardless. So this is just the very first episode. And I hope you tune in for future episodes. I really enjoy doing this. And I really hope to share more with you and hope to speak with others about Lucha Libre, speak with others about uh, the companies in Mexico. And now Lucha Libre is worldwide. So really wrestling and Lucha Libre uh, around the world. So first up, Let's talk about what's happening today. Let's talk about the LWO. And this is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Um, ever since the LWO have come back, uh, back in April when they first came back, um, I've been just really interested in them because the original LWO, the short-lived, I still feel like they were very iconic, even though they didn't really win anything, they didn't really do anything, and they broke up before ever really getting an attraction. It was like they were gathering up members, and then boom, Eddie Guerrero gets hurt. Um, let's uh, cut this LWO thing off and move on to something else, which kind of sucked uh, looking back. But now we have this new LWO, um, less members, Rey Mysterio's heading it. And I've been interested in them since April when they came back. And they had been taking loss after loss after loss, which had me pretty disappointed. But since Backlash with Bad Bunny donning the LWO shirt, We've been up, you know. Um, just this past Friday, Santos Escobar, he got the the pin in a victory against the Usos. And although it was not a clean victory, I'll still take it, right? I love Santos Escobar. I think that he should be one of the next big guys in WWE. I'm happy that he's with Rey Mysterio. You know, Rey Mysterio, super long, illustrious career, Hall of Famer easily. I mean, he really is already in the WWE Hall of Fame and he's still going. Um, and I think in the future we will probably do a whole episode just on Santos Escobar, probably a whole episode on Rey Mysterio, just because, you know, there's a lot to talk about there, um, in terms of histories and their futures and things like that. Um, in AEW news, I am happy to see Bandito getting action on TV. He came back a couple weeks ago. He's been on, on TV getting featured pretty regularly and Bandito, he is that guy, you know, he looks tremendous, looks fantastic. Um, Roosh, he had a great performance this past week on Dynamite, just beating the dirt off of Jungle Boy, and he didn't get the win, makes sense he didn't get the win, but he still looked incredible, he looked dominant, he looked strong, he looked like Roosh, he looked, he looked like El Rudo, right, he was him, and I can't wait, you know, in, in the perfect future, in the perfect reality, Roosh has some gold around his waist in AEW, and maybe we will get to see that one day. Um, Andrade, El Idol, he's coming back, finally, on the new AEW show, Collision. He was revealed on the promotional poster, the promotional materials for AEW. Very, very happy to see that. I love Andrade, I love Roosh, and I hope that we get a huge, 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 uh, Faccion Ingobernable presence when they're back together. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if they've announced Roosh being featured on Collision, but it would make a lot of sense. You put Roosh on there. You put Andrade on there. You put um, Jose the Assistant and Preston Vance. You put the entire faction together. And, you know, you got something to build on there. Um, Lucha Brothers, Pentagon Jr., Ray Phoenix. They have a title match next week. The Ring of Honor titles are, uh, the Ring of Honor tag titles are on the line against the Blackpool Combat Club on Dynamite. Should be a fun match. Should be a good one. I don't expect the uh, titles to change. Probably won't even end clean, but it'll probably be a pretty good match to watch anyways. Not sure how long it'll go, but, you know, the Lucha Brothers, they're always entertaining to watch. Um, Blackpool Combat Club, they're always entertaining to watch. We should have a, a nice little something going there. In CMLL news, uh, last night, Viernes Espectacular, we had a, uh, we had a pretty big match um, for the Junior Cup, the Junior VIP Cup. Soberano Jr. and Dragon Rojo Jr., they advance to the finals of the Junior's VIP Cup. They face off next Friday. They were the final two of an elimination-style tag match between Mystico, Panterita del Ring Jr., Soberano Jr., uh, and Dra Dragon Rojo Jr. against uh, Atlantis Jr., Hijo del Viano Tercero, Averno, and Volador Jr. I mean, it was like two teams. The last two people would end up um, facing off the next week for the actual cup. Um, and this was a good match. I really enjoyed it. There was a spot with uh, Hijo de Viano Tercero. 
Uh, he was trying to get over the top rope. He was trying to launch himself out of the ring over the top rope. He clipped his foot on the rope, um, fell down. He was okay, but that was just really notable to me. I, when I saw that happen, I was like, ooh, you know, looked like it hurt. Um, made him fall down. He, he didn't get caught all the way, but I don't think he hit as hard. I don't th- hopefully he's not hurt or anything. I don't think he was. He seemed to continue the match pretty well. Um, the end of the match, there was a run in by Rocky Romero. He said he came out to help Volador Jr. Volador Jr. didn't want his help. He didn't want to win that way. And good for him because he ended up losing anyway. Um, but this set up a match between Rocky Romero and Volador Jr. for Rocky's title. Um, I think this will be entertaining. I was definitely entertained by this main event. I don't regret paying for the uh, Viernes Espectacular this week. I think it was a good one. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably keep doing it in the future for every other card that I see in CML that I think I will really like with guys who uh, I really enjoy watching. And one last uh, piece of information here to end this segment. There's reports coming out. Um, I think Nick Khan said that the WWE was possibly looking at a Lucha Libre show. This is exciting, but it's also a little worrying. But I'm going to be very optimistic about it just based on how much I've enjoyed uh, the WWE shows here in the past, you know, two, three months. Ever since the Royal Rumble, I've I've thought that, you know, the shows have been really good. Um, They've been... Booked well, good storylines, everything like that. People may disagree, and that's fine. We all have different opinions. I'm not going to trash you if you think the shows have been bad, but I've really been enjoying them. Um, Anyway, they are talking about, you know, possibly making a Lucha Libre-only show. Obviously, this would probably not even come for a couple years. If they're just now thinking of it, they're just now throwing the idea around. It It may never materialize. But if it does, I think that's a net positive for Lucha Libre. That's a net positive for... Um, guys from Mexico and guys who work the Lucha Libre style specifically, I think that WWE could build a good foundation for this show. Um, I think that their success back in 2016 with the Cruiserweight Classic, it's not the exact same thing. Obviously, it's not, um, you know, it's not the same as just only Luchadores, but they had some really good guys going back then. A lot of the Cruiserweight Classic matches were fantastic, but then you see how they really dropped the ball with the Cruiserweight division after that, and that's what brings the worry in. Oh, can they handle this? Um, you know, WWE has had a history of not really having a lot of successful Luchadores in the company. I mean, if you look the past 20 years of all the guys who've gone to the WWE from Lucha Libre and just didn't end up working out. I mean, Rey Mysterio worked out. Eddie Guerrero worked out. Anyone else on their level, I can't really think of. Andrade worked out to a degree, I will say. Andrade La Sombra. He worked out to a degree. He had some great matches in WWE. And I think he could probably, if he ever came back, he could probably have some more great matches. But he's over in AEW now. Um, but, you know, there's for, for every Rey Mysterio, there's the Mexicals. There's... um. Sin Cara, Mystico, um, Grand Metallic, the Lucha House Party, Callisto, Lince Dorado. You know, it's scary to think of sometimes. Um, but if they really commit to it and if they really are saying, hey, we're really going to try this. This isn't going to be a secondary thought for us. We're going to put effort into this and we're going to make this a really good show. That's exciting. If it's an afterthought, uh, maybe it's not so good. Anyway. That's it for this first segment. It was going a little longer than I thought, but we're going to jump right into our next segment, our Lucha History on Juventud Guerrera. Juventud Guerrera was one of the most exciting cruiserweights in the prime of the WCW cruiserweight division. He was shining alongside guys like Rey Mysterio Jr., Eddie Guerrero, Chris Jericho, and Dean Malenko. So what happened to him? Let's start at the beginning, 1992. Son of the great Fuerza Guerrera, Juvi first started gaining notoriety in AAA, facing off against Rey Mysterio Jr. and teaming with his dad. Juvi got noticed and would leave Mexico in 96 to go wrestle in ECW for a bit and then eventually land in WCW. Juvi would also wrestle some matches with Promo Azteca, which was his dad, Fuerza Guerrera's promotion in Mexico at that time, and um, WAR over in Japan. This is where I consider Juvi to have been in his prime. Juventud Guerrera would win the WCW Cruiserweight Championship twice, win the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title in a very shady way for like a week, and lose his mask to Chris Jericho as well. 
He would be a part of the short-lived but iconic LWO, and even a part of the Filthy Animals, alongside Mysterio, Conan, Disco, and Tigress. Huvi's time in WCW would end after four years after an incident in Australia in which Huvi was found screaming and naked in the hallways of his hotel under the influence of PCP. His fellow wrestlers couldn't get him under control, so the police had to be called. Even then, Huvi managed to break a rib of one of the officers called to control him. Huvi's issues off-screen would not end here, as he would garner a reputation of being difficult to work with and generally have a bad attitude. During Hoovy's short time with the WWE, he was given two cruiserweight title reigns, but was released shortly after the second because of issues he was having with people backstage. There's a lot of interviews documenting and describing uh, Hoovy's antics throughout the years, things that he has done backstage and really in the ring. And I found that Conan, um, he has had a lot to say about Juventud Guerrera, and really any time he's asked... Um, and most of what Conan says um, seems to be backed up by others as well, confirmed by others, and I'm inclined to believe him uh, based on this. Um, it matches up with everything everyone else says about Hoovy. Uh, one of the issues that people had with Hoovy is how he would just not sell for guys. Um, if he thought he was better than you in the ring, he's not going to sell for you. He's not going to make you look good. Right. He, he quote unquote, goes into the business for himself a lot. He makes himself look really, really good out there. And he tries to make you look awful, even when you're booked to win. If he's booked to lose, if who he's booked to lose, he's going to make you look bad. And I do want to share some examples of some of the crazy who and Guerrera stories that I've come across um, on the Internet. And not all of them, but I do want to share some of the best ones, some of the most interesting ones that I found. And the first one involves who in triple A. So the story goes that Hoovy had some real issues and some real heat with X-Pac, who was working AAA at the time. And this story comes from Conan, um, who was booking AAA. So I would assume he has got some merit to it. Maybe not all the details, or maybe I don't know all the details, and maybe he left some out, but this is the gist of the story. Um, so Hoovy does something to X-Pac. X-Pac makes him or X-Pac gets incredibly mad at him, furious, and X-Pac would put a piece of manure in Hoovy's luggage, kind of to get back at him, you know, as a you know, piece of revenge. Hoovy doesn't know who did it. So, for some reason, um, I guess him and Conan must have had some issues at the time, he goes and he blames Conan. And it wasn't Conan who did it, but, you know, that doesn't stop Hoovy from accusing him. Um, who he goes out and works a, I think it was a battle royal. He works a match and Conan says that, um, a lot of the guys were taking shots at Hoovy during the match. Cause I guess maybe he was not very well liked. Um, but who he comes back after the match, he tries to berate Conan for it. He like, kind of tries to confront him again. Uh, Conan says he picks up a chair and he starts charging at Conan. But before he gets to him, Jack Evans jumps in and just starts beating down Hoovy. And Hoovy himself has gone on podcasts to confirm some of the things he's done and generally speak on others as well. Um, a couple of years ago, you can find a clip of him, I think on his own podcast, speaking negatively on Conan and Rey Mysterio, which I thought was kind of weird. Um, he calls Rey Mysterio a few choice curse words, and he seems mad that Rey at this time wouldn't want to work with him. He doesn't want to work with him. He asked Rey Mysterio on a, a world tour. Not sure what that is. Um, but I'm not exactly sure why Hoovy is upset here because if this was a couple of years ago, back in 2020, um, Rey Mysterio was with the WWE at that time. So how could he have even worked with Hoovy? Most of the time, WWE does not allow, you know, external dates. I don't know. Maybe Hoovy thought he was big enough that WWE would be like, yeah, go work with Hoovy too. But he's upset at him for this. Um, Hoovy on other podcasts as well, has talked about how he didn't really like the Mexicals, but he says that he's the one who came up with the name Mexicals. Um, he says that, and I, I kind of agree with him, because in hindsight, the Mexicals were not that great in the WWE, but he does talk about how he wanted the Mexicals to be more like what Andrade is now, kind of like that flashy, kind of like what Alberto Patron is with that flashy, high, elegant kind of Mexican, and not really the Gardner trope, um, that stereotype, which I kind of agree with him there. Um, the Gardner trope, while at the time, I guess they got away with it, it definitely wouldn't fly today. And it's definitely not, it was not that good of a gimmick. It was kind of awful. 
Anyway, Huvi confirms as well that he had some issues with Super Crazy, and I think he had some issues with psychosis during the Mexico time. Um, and yeah, I believe that as well. He says that they're cool now. He says they're all cool now, and those issues, you know, blown over. There is, a, you know, water under the bridge, basically. And Huvi's WWE issues extended beyond the Mexicals as well. He was banned from using his 450 Splash um, because he destroyed Paul London's face with it uh, in a match. And even though it was banned, he ended up using it again in his last match against Kid Cash. Um, again, Hoovy doing what Hoovy wants to do. And really, you could summarize this entire segment with Hoovy gets in the way of Hoovy. And he doesn't even realize it a lot of the time. This is the sentiment that seems echoed across uh, really anybody who talks about him online. Um, you see most of these guys saying, yeah, Hoovy was incredibly talented, but the guy can't get out of his own way. You know, he doesn't really have. He didn't really have the attitude. He didn't really have the mindset to be the top guy, even though he thought he was the top guy a lot of the time. Allegedly is what people say. Um, it just never really materialized and he did have some great times in WCW but it seems that he himself would end up derailing what could have been a very promising career. Hoovy really had the talent, the athleticism, and the look to go far. However, he didn't really have the mindset or the attitude that was needed. In my eyes, Hoovy remains as one of the biggest what-ifs in pro wrestling. Okay, so this is a segment that I um, don't have an official name for yet, but I think maybe I want to call it the Lucha Movie Spotlight. Um, what we're doing here in this little segment is we're going to be talking about Lucha Libre movies and why. So these movies are a product of their time, really, a product of the environment of you know what it was, what Lucha Libre was to the culture at that time, um, the level of entertainment that it was bringing and they're, they're fun, they're ridiculous, they're really campy, um, they're extremely charming, I think. A lot of practical effects, a lot of, you know, just fun little things happening um, in them, and they're very fun to watch. I really enjoy watching them, and I'm going to include this segment in future episodes of this podcast because um, I, I just really enjoy these movies, and I really like talking about them, and I really like sharing what happens in them, and a lot of people... Uh, have watched these movies. These movies, you know, they did pretty good. Um, but I feel like a lot of people, uh, they haven't watched them. Like, they've heard of them and they know, oh, El Santo, you know, he, he did a lot of movies. Uh, he did the most, actually, of anybody, of any luchador at the time. He was, he did 52, 52 of these films. And we're going to be doing Los Santo movies, but we're not going to be only doing Los Santo movies. Um, Blue Demon, he had a lot of movies. Mil Mascaras, he had a lot of movies. And then other luchadors also had uh, you know, more than one movie made uh, for them. And in a lot of these, they are, you know, horror, action, um, you know, just things that things that involve um, a luchador saving the day using his skills that he learned in the ring, basically, or using skills that he picked up in his travels, things like that. Um, the way we're talking about today is the 1971 film, Los Campeones Justicieros. And this movie uh, has two main stars, uh, Blue Demon and Mil Mascaras. And then we have some supporting cast as well, and Medico Asesino, Tinieblas, El Gigante, La Sombra Vengadora. And then on the evil side, I guess as kind of an antagonist, um, I wouldn't even call him the main antagonist, he's more of a secondary antagonist, is Black Shadow. And if you know Black Shadow, he was really important to the history of Lucha Libre. And, you know, he was in a few movies as well. Um, but Black Shadow is also in this film. Um, what the movie is basically about, and this isn't just going to be only a plot synopsis. I, I do want to talk about the plot because I do think it is very important and I do think it's very fun. Um, but the movie is basically this team of five guys, you know, Blue Demon, Mil Mascaras, Medico Asesino, Tinieblas, uh, La Sombra Vengadora. These five guys, they are, you know, working together and they're being targeted by this evil scientist. The movie opens up... Um, they're at a show, they're at a wrestling event, uh, Lucha Libre, and um, it's it's Mil Mascaras and Blue Demon, and they're wrestling just these two guys, I guess, uh, they don't really get a name at the beginning of the film, I don't even remember their name if they were given one later, but they're wrestling these two guys, and you know, they're doing pretty well in the ring, and then these guys, 
these little henchmen, and I call them little henchmen because they are very small. These little henchmen just open fire. <laughs> they just start lighting the place up with these little machine guns, which they weren't even originally machine guns. I don't know. I think they were their radios turned into machine guns. These little contraptions, these little devices, they just air it out. They're just pop, 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 blasting. They're just indiscriminately shooting in the ring. And somehow our luchadors are dodging the bullets. I mean, Mascaras gets hit on the shoulder, minor injury, flesh wound. It's just quite literally, I it hit him, but he, he, he went past it. Blue Demon is dodging bullets somehow, and the range is not even that far. The bullets are, you know, just normal bullets. So these guys have skills beyond the normal where they can dodge bullets, see where they're coming from, and, you know, stay safe. Except for Mascaras, he took a hit. But, um... The guys run away after they shoot up the place. It's like pandemonium in the chaos. They run away, and you see them um, meeting up with this evil scientist. And this evil scientist, in this next scene, he's kind of angry at him. He's like, you guys didn't get rid of them. You didn't shoot them up. And he he grants his little henchmen strength beyond their own, basically. He puts them in this machine, covers up their whole body, fires the machine up, um, and they come out and he's like, well, I don't feel any different. I don't look any different. And he's like, he, he says to Black Shadow, because I guess Black Shadow under normal means is his strongest henchman. He says to Black Shadow, he's like, hey, uh, fight this guy, test this guy out. And the little dude just beats the dirt off of Black Shadow, <laughs> right? Just to show that his strength has been augmented so heavily, so much that Black Shadow is a pushover. And normally, you know, Black Shadow is very formidable opponent, uh, probably on the level of Blue Demon, on the level of Mil Mascaras. He's a, he's a formidable guy, but because of this evil scientist's interference, he is now relegated to just another henchman, because if all the henchmen are strong, then, you know, what is he? He's nothing special anymore, right? Anyway, um, the augmentation is not permanent. The, the, the henchmen, the smaller henchmen, they don't stay strong forever. Um, they don't stay strong, you know, it's a limited amount of time, and um, we see it throughout the film when, when there's a lot of ambushes, and I'll talk about this later, but they get ambushed by the little guys, and they're so shocked that these guys are just beating the nerd off of them, and their their attacks are doing nothing to them because they're so augmented, they're so strong, but after a certain amount of time, the strength wears away, and they're just able to toss them around like nothing, basically. They're able to just beat, beat them black and blue, basically. Um, anyway, the main, the main plot centers around it's a kidnapping plot this is one of the big points in the plot uh, the evil scientist the evil doctor him and his henchmen steal a group of women and these women were set to compete in a very prestigious beauty pageant in mexico um i don't know if it's like miss mexico i have no idea i mean i when i was watching it it was better explained but the gist of it is they're comp they're competing in this beauty pageant and they kidnap these women <laughs> In, in you know, I guess they're keeping an eye on where they are. They wait for all the luchadors to leave. <laughs> they're in this unmarked car right outside the venue. The luchadors walk right by the car. They're suspecting nothing. They get on their motorbikes, they get in their cars, and they drive off. And then all the henchmen come out of the car, and they just run in. Um, they cut the lights. They cut the communications so they can't call the luchadors. They grab, they grab up these women, and they transport them to the secret hideout. And the whole point is that they're... They freeze these ladies in like a, I guess like a flash freeze chamber to make sure that they don't escape. And then they start loading them in these boxes because they're going to ship them off to another country um, for God knows what. But I guess this is part of the evil scientist's plan. Maybe he's going to conduct experiments on them in another country. Um, it's explained better, but this is, I guess, this is just the gist of it. Um, and there's this sequence, <laughs> there's this sequence in the movie where, where Blue Demon and Mil Mascaras they find where the women are going to be transported because they're getting taken out by plane. They're getting taken out on a plane. They load up the uh, the evil henchmen. They load up the plane, and they um, it takes off. But Mil Mascaras and Blue Demon got in the back, and they're you know hiding out. And there's this scene where Blue Demon surprises the pilot, and he's like, "Take us back, you know, basically land the plane, land the plane." And the pilot is like, "Yeah, okay, I'll comply." The pilot takes his parachute and jumps out of the plane and he's like yeah good luck basically i'm getting away and you know the, the plane's gonna crash or whatever blue demon does not have a parachute this fool jumps out of the plane <laughs> free falling somehow grabs onto the pilot is pummeling him in the air right 
It's not like he's grabbing on and then like when they land, he pummels him. He's pummeling him, him in the air, just beating the dirt off of him. The only guy with a parachute. He's latched onto him, make sure he's not going to fall off. He's just beating him. And then when they get on the ground, he just keeps beating him. Meanwhile, Mil Mascaras is still in the plane overhead. <laughs> he's uh, somehow gained the skills to, to land this plane, to pilot and land this plane. So he lands it. And Blue Demon, when he gets down to Blue Demon, Blue Demon is just still beating the dirt off of this pilot guy on the ground, just pummeling him, beating him hard. And um, basically, they get the women safely. They get them back on the ground safely. And there's a lot of action sequences like this that are, you know, just kind of corny but fun. Um, and they're not horrible, honestly. Like, when I was watching it, I was like, yeah, this is campy, but this isn't horrible you know as long as you go into it knowing this is what you're going to see you're not expecting to see you know a hollywood blockbuster you're expecting to see a film of the time and um so the other sequences there's a motorcycle chase with mean mascaras he's getting chased by the henchmen and they run his motorcycle off a cliff this fool somehow reaches out and he's falling off the cliff he reaches out grabs a tree branch saves himself pulls himself back up the cliff the motorcycle vereens off it just keeps going crashes the bottom of the cliff, explodes. Mean Mascara sees it explode. He gets back up. He climbs up over. He gets ambushed by the, by these henchmen, by these little henchmen, and then uh, one of the regular henchmen, or one of the taller henchmen. And it happens again. This, this sequence, again, is a very similar sequence to later on where the henchmen are trying to get away. They ambush all five of the luchadors this time, or I guess maybe three of them, and then the other the other ones show up, so it's more even, and then their augmentation kind of wears off, so they're trying to get away. They're trying to get away. They get in, they pack into this car, and they start speeding off, but then um, I think it's Tinieblas or Medico Asesino. They pull out in front of the car, so he has to turn really quickly. He hits a post. The car vereens again off a cliff. These guys don't get out of the car. The henchmen just straight up die in a fiery blast. <laughs> the explosion, I'm assuming, just cooks them um and the whole time you just see these luchadors at the top of this cliff just looking over watching i guess the the car they're just kind of like ooh, you know like this car has exploded these guys are dead but uh, yeah, it wasn't us and i guess they were evil so <laughs> i think it's just very funny the way the action is presented um towards the beginning of the film there's a lot of explosions towards the beginning of the film where we see blue demon he's leaving this arena and um, I think he's with this woman. He's leaving this arena. He has his bag. And I guess the person running the valet is going to go start his motorcycle for him. And he carries his bag to go put on the motorcycle and then start it and pull it up, warm it up. So Blue Demon can get on and speed away. This fool gets on the motorcycle, turns the key. As soon as the key turns, the motorcycle explodes, just blowing him to bits. Blue Demon does not say a word. I don't even think he blinks. He looks at the explosion. It cuts back to Blue Demon looking at the explosion. His teeth are just clenched, and that's it. He watched this guy get blown to smithereens, and it looks like he's more preoccupied about his luggage getting hurt than than the guy's uh, health or anything because he's just kind of like emotionless, teeth clenched a bit, but nothing is really said after that. Um, there's a lot of fighting in random fields. Like I said, there's a lot of ambush scenes where blue demon or mil mascaras would be walking in this field going to try to meet with somebody to you know um rescue these women figure out the whereabouts of these women and the henchmen all these all the the little henchmen just run out and just start beating them beating them like dogs basically and um they're doing a lot of lucha libre moves out in these fields and it's pretty entertaining i i think it's very entertaining to see them just do lucha libre moves out in a grassy field um fighting each other and they always, you know, they always have the upper hand at first. And then, you know, our champion luchadors, they flip the script and they start winning. Uh, there's a mind control subplot, which is, you know, just classic for these films. Um, La Sombra Vengadora, uh, he gets set up, basically. And I'm going to talk more about who sets him up later. But he's he's kind of tired, like he's asleep in his house. And somebody calls him on the phone. He picks up the phone. <laughs> And um, I think it's like the evil scientist on the other hand, on the other line, and he's talking to him. But then somehow knockout gas starts coming out of the phone receiver. I don't know how the evil scientist has somehow sent knockout gas from his location through the phone lines to wherever La Sombra is, and it just weakens him. He gets up. He he. I guess he tries to leave his place to go get help. Outside of his door, the other henchmen are waiting. They just bust his door down they literally just punch his door down 
beat the dirt off of him in his own house, <laughs> kidnap him. They capture him. They take him to the to the hideout. It's like five guys beat him up. They take him to the hideout. Um, they like try to interrogate him. They try to break him. And then they force him to fight this other guy, this other, I guess, luchador, this other fighter. They force him to fight him to the death, basically um, testing his strength, seeing how strong he really is to see if they really want to mind control him. And like they just have him in the middle of this room. All the henchmen are like in a circle watching him just fighting this other guy. And they're beating each other pretty bad. But La Sombra ends up killing this guy just straight up to the death. He like using wrestling move, he kills this guy and he's just laying there dead. <laughs> and then they they uh, give him some sort of drug. They drug La Sombra and they mind control him um, all the way till the end of the movie. So now La Sombra, it's four against, you know, it's just the Dinieblas, um, Medico Asesino, uh, Blue Demon, and Mil Mascaras. La Sombra's not on their team anymore because he's, he's mind controlled, basically. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the film <laughs> and... Um, uh, this is after the women have been rescued from the plane, after they land the plane. It's Tinieblas and Medico Asesino. They're, they're in a boat. Um, they're, they're water skiing, jet skiing, I guess. I don't know what the correct term for that would be, jet skiing with this woman who's been with them the entire time. Her name is Elsa. And um, Elsa was not kidnapped with the other models. Um, she's just, I guess, kind of their friend at this point. And I think she might have some sort of romantic interest with... La Sombra, because she was the last person with him before he got uh, uh, kidnapped at his house and, you know, got the dirt beat off of him. And they're, you know, Medico Asesino, Tinieblas, they're wearing some classic Speedos. They're on the water. They're on these boats, on this boat. They're jet skiing. They got a nice tan going. Um, Elsa bails off the jet ski. Medico Asesino and Tinieblas are like, oh, she must have gotten tired. But then they hear this ticking. They look down. Time bomb. They jump off the boat. They start swimming back to shore. They get pulled down under the water by these henchmen with uh, scuba diving gear. And they fight these guys underwater and they win. Uh, because at this point, uh, Blue Demon and Mil Mascaras have just pulled up from rescuing the women in the plane. They jump into the water. They help beat the dirt off of these guys underwater. They get up out of the water and then they're like, we know where they are and we know who has been setting us up? It's been Elsa this entire time. Elsa has been working for this evil scientist and selling them, selling them information, um, or selling them out basically to this evil scientist, setting them up uh, for every time they've been ambushed, every time they've been attacked. It's been because of her. She was the reason that, that La Sombra was captured. So they go, they go straight from, they don't even like suit up or anything. They go straight from here to the evil scientist's lair because, and you can tell they go straight from there because Tinieblas and Medico Asesino show up still wet and in Speedos. <laughs> and the first scene of this this final fight is Tinieblas, the, the henchmen are posted up with guns. Like they have machine guns. They're posted up ready to shoot. Tinieblas runs in, dodge rolls through the bullets. <laughs> the bullets completely mess him. He picks up this little henchman, twirls him around and hurls him through this really complicated looking piece of lab equipment, it explodes. <laughs> and then they, they, the fight continues. They're fighting all the henchmen and stuff. They're getting the upper hand. Um, <laughs> as they're fighting, uh, the, the evil scientist is standing in the corner of his lair. They don't even get to capture him. This fool pops a pill. I don't know what type of perk he was on. He pops a pill and he just slowly disappears. Like his body just slowly dissipates into nothing. So... I don't know if it's some sort of teleportation pill, some sort of invisibility pill, but the scene where it happens is just so funny because he just fades away slowly after popping this pill. Um, Blue Demon fights Black Shadow. Before he fights Black Shadow, they free uh, La Sombra's mind, and he's like, he's like, where am I? And Blue Demon is like, uh, you were captured and put under mind control by a drug. And La Sombra just straight up says, oh, yeah, now I remember. Thanks, Blue Demon. And then he's like, let me help you bite feet. Let me help you fight this guy talking about black shadow and blue demons. Like, no, it's time we settle this score. And all the, all the henchmen are kind of captured. Tinieblas and Medico Asesino are holding them at gunpoint. Make sure they don't try anything. Mil Mascaras and uh, La Sombra are watching, just watching blue demon and black shadow fight in the middle of this lab. Blue demon wins. Um, cuts to the next scene. They're at this pageant. The women are better now, you know, 
They're not captured anymore. They're not frozen. They're at this pageant. We get a scene of that. And then all five of these guys jump on their motorcycles with supermodels on the back. And then credits roll. They're just driving off. Just beginning to end, it's cinema. I would highly recommend watching this. Um, if you are interested in it, it is on YouTube. It has English subtitles. You can watch it on there. The quality is not perfect, but it's not horrible. It's watchable, at least. Um, Los Campeones Justicieros. I don't know if I said the name at the beginning, but I, if if I didn't, I'm saying it now. Los Campeones Justicieros. Um, you can look it up. There's a part two and a part three. I've not watched those yet. It's kind of hard to watch part two because I can't find it in good quality. I might have to actually find like a DVD or something to watch it. Um, part three, you can find a good quality, but I want to watch two before I watch three. Um, but I really would highly recommend watching it. Even if you don't want to read like the t subtitles and if you don't know Spanish, you could get through the film without really understanding any of the dialogue because the action and the way the sequences are built, you're kind of understanding what's going on just based on seeing what's on the screen. So to a degree, you're still understanding what's happening. You're still getting that enjoyment. And, um, you know, you're still being able to watch the film. So, yeah, if I had to rate this film, and this is a scale not out of all movies, out of Lucha Libre movies, this has probably been my favorite one that I've watched. I would give it a solid 5 out of 5 on the Lucha Libre movie scale. And I would highly recommend watching it. It's very fun. It's very entertaining. And, you know, it's, it's worth the hour, the hour and a half that you're going to spend watching it, especially if it's on a Saturday, if it's at night, um, you don't got nothing to do. You don't got nothing to watch. There's no uh, events going on. There's no matches that you want to see. You want to watch something campy and fun, pop this in. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely worth, definitely worth watching. And that is it for this week's episode of the Club Lucha Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any feedback, comments, concerns, you want to send in some questions or requests, feel free to email us at theclublucha at gmail.com. You can also follow us over on TikTok. Send me a DM there at Club Lucha on TikTok. We are on YouTube as well at, I believe it's The Club Lucha. Um, you can just Google Club Lucha. You'll find us here. It's the same uh, little picture if you Google Club Lucha or if you YouTube, if you search uh, Club Lucha on YouTube. You'll find us here. You'll find us on Spotify. You'll find us on TikTok. And you can send us through email. Um, but yeah, until next time, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And have a great day.